So, hi, hi everybody. I, I hope you hear us well. Uh, I'm very happy as as the, as the current director of the CRFG uh, French Research Center in Jerusalem to welcome you for this uh, first, very first uh, round table in like double hybrid uh, round table, which is uh, very difficult because we have uh, speakers in the CRFG, we have speakers outside everywhere and we have uh, public in the crfg and we have public uh, outside so it's it should it should not work but we will see how how much it won't work and uh, so um we will we will uh, try to 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 organize the um, the session uh in a dynamic way uh, and and we we we, we asked the, the authors to to speak together for uh, several sessions. Um, uh, before this, I, I want to thank uh, Pascal uh, Guachel. Hi, Pascal. Hi. And mm -hmm. Evelyn, where are you? Yes, Evelyn is in her garden, Paradisia Garden here. And because they, Pascal and, and Evelyn did work a lot for Quite a uh, lot. The, yes, the finalization of this uh, special issue. Uh, as uh, Avner Benamos did, and I will uh, immediately uh, give uh, the, the the place to Avner. He will uh, he will try to introduce the discussion, and after we will uh, listen for the others. Avner. Hello, everybody, and uh, good evening from. Jerusalem. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking uh, Vincent for hosting us in this uh, beautiful library of the uh, French Research Center of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, this is quite a production and I hope uh, we manage to uh, succeed and carry it out until the uh, day end. And uh, let me say a, a few words about the uh, rationale of this um, special issue. Um, in order to explain it, we have to go back about uh, three weeks ago to the annual celebration of Israeli Independence Day, which takes place every year on the 5th of the Jewish month of Iyar, and which commemorates the Israeli declaration of independence that took place on that very same date in 1948. Now, everybody in Israel was celebrating Independence Day three weeks ago. Everybody except the Palestinians, for whom it was a day of mourning. As we know, the, for the Palestinians of Israel and those of the occupied territories, the 1948 war was not a war of independence, uh, but as they call it, the Nakba, that is the catastrophe in Arabic, because of the defeat and the beginning of the exile. As a consequence, they do not commemorate the 1948 war on the 5th of Iyar, but on the 15th of May. The date in the Gregorian calendar of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. So we get one event, the war, but two national communities, two versions of the past and two different commemorative dates. However, there are other options. The day before Independence Day, on Memorial Day, Israeli Jews commemorated the soldiers who had fallen for the country. And the evening before, there were many official commemorative ceremonies for them. But there was also one unique non-official ceremony organized by two Jewish Palestinians NGOs that 
commemorated together all the victims of war and terrorist attacks on both sides, Jews and Palestinians. This unique ceremony took place for the first time in 2006, and since then, it has attracted more and more participants this year because of the pandemic. The ceremony took place in Zoom with the participation of about 200,000 people from all over the world. I was one of them, and it was a moving experience. So this dual way of looking at the past brings me back to the rationale of our special issue. For a long period, the dominant approach to the history of Jewish Arab relations in Palestine, Israel, was characterized by three main features. First, a dual society approach, which assumed that Jewish and Arab societies were separate, self-contained, and mutually hostile entities whose main mode of interaction was an often violent conflict. This outlook, therefore, placed primary focus on the Zionist and Palestinian national movements. Second, both societies were studies from above, through the examination of the political leaders, diplomats and military men, and emphasis on the confrontations. Finally, the 1948 war was marked as a momentous event that dictated the research agenda of the period beginning in the late 19th century with the first wave of Zionist immigration from Eastern Europe. Like the French Revolution in the history of 18 century France or the Holocaust in the history of German Jewish relations, the 1948 war became an inevitable telos that cast a long shadow over the preceding period, painting it in a single color. Over the past 20 years, however, another perspective has slowly emerged. And I would let Vincent explain to you what is this new perspective all about. Yes, very, very quickly, uh, just to, to underline that uh, for building this new perspective, uh, the authors we, which will uh, speak uh, today are trying to work on a relational uh, perspective between the two communities. And to, to get this, uh, this uh, objective, they, they have to work on new historical sources maybe less official documents and more uh, ego documents, visual image, ethnographic uh, records. This is the first uh, issue, the question of the archives and the, and the sources. The second issue is maybe to, to choose new objects, um, more diverse objects as uh, leisures, uh, literature, of course, music, uh, philanthropy, and so on. And, and this, uh, Tonight we will we will try to 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 show that with this uh, with this diversity of objects we can open more widely the, the per perspective of this uh, cultural history uh, of this relationship as political history because of course as you understand with the introduction by Avner uh, in our point of view uh, a, a cultural history is of course a political history and the 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 last point is to underline that. We, we did not try, and I think that the, the, the authors here did not try to build a kind of optimistic history or pink painted history of this uh, relationship. Uh, because they will show that this cooperation of, or, or these meetings uh, efforts have often failed. And the, the only question is that maybe these failures could be some uh, source of inspiration for the uh, future generations. So um, we we stop here with the introduction. We just have like five minutes late, uh, same than okay. at the beginning. And so we will try with the first um, first set um, with um, with Louis Fishman and, and uh, Sarah Sarah Ir Irving. 
Uh, Louis Fishman is uh, teaching in Brooklyn College uh, in uh, New York and uh, Sarah uh, Irving in Edge Hill University, UK and Great Britain. And they will, uh, they will try to, yes, to, to maybe to fix a, a kind of political, uh, geopolitical framework of our discussion from Ottoman Empire to British Mandate. And maybe they will try, Louis and Sarah, to discuss how a cultural history is or is not a political history. Uh, we begin with uh, Louis Fishman because, as as an Ottomanist, he is he had the the, the yes the priority uh, with the chronology. I think Louis, yes, it's, uh, it's the morning uh, in New York. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, so I understand we have four minutes. Um, so I prepared um, a short talk. For, uh, it should be about exactly about four minutes. Hopefully, it might be four and a half minutes. But I won't waste time. I'll get go ahead and maybe in the question and answers we can talk about. The question you posed us just now. In the in the article, Arab Jewish voices in Ottoman Palestine, caught between the Sephardim and Palestinians, I set out to rethink the role of Arab Jews in Palestine within the context of the late Ottoman era, arguing that despite previous works showing the Sephardim as putting forth the idea of a quote shared homeland, it was the Arabic speaking Jews, some who also defined themselves as Arabs were putting forth the staunchest opposition to Palestinian local patriotism. In fact, in this piece, I showed that there was a chasm between the local Arab population who were uniting under a new sense of Palestinianism embraced by both Muslims and Christians and the Arabic speaking Jews whose Zionism placed a barrier between them and the local Arab population. Thus, even if some Jews spoke Arabic, Arabic maintain intellectual networks in Cairo, Beirut, and Istanbul, and define themselves as, quote, Arab, this was not enough to unify them with Palestinian Arabs. In fact, in Jerusalem, the Sephardic community as a whole started to adopt Hebrew as a main mode of communication, separating them from the local Palestinians, with them creating bonds with the Ashkenazim, making the realities in Jerusalem very different than in Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad, and Cairo, where, where Arabic was by far the main language of communication between the majority of Jews, or in Istanbul, Izmir, Sofia, and Salonika, where Ladino, Judeo, and Spaniel was the dominant language. Different than the previous work on Nisim Malul, Shimon Moyal, Esther Azhari Moyal, Avraham El Maliach, and Albert and Tebi, which has provided a wide base for understanding the history of the Sephardim in Palestine, in addition to serving as a foundation, develop our knowledge of the Arabic speaking local Jews, I argue that this group actually does not seem to have been representative of the Sephardim at large, but was a small group of intellectuals who, whose experiences outside of Palestine influenced them, while their ties in Palestine to Jewish institution, institutions Zionist and non-Zionist made them key members of the Yeshuv. I also point the Jewish community in Palestine, the Yeshuv. I also point out that their towering personalities provide another piece of proof that during the late Ottoman era, the Ashkenazim were not the dominant elite, elite but rather shared the social and political spheres with an organized Sephardic community. It was this community which through their newspaper, HaKherut, led the quote war on the Arab press with Palestinian papers, Philistine and El Carmel, their main targets. If the Ashkenazi socialist Zionists were acting for the conquest of labor and acting out for the conquest of labor, and the Zionist organization for the conquest of land, then the Sephardim now had their war to wage the conquest of the press. These conquests, of course, were not coordinated. That's what gave the issue of its strength. Each community worked on different fronts, often in tandem, but sometimes in disagreement, with the common goal of strengthening the Yeshuv, which included Zionist institutions and non-Zionist ones alike. Due to, due to the very fact that the Yeshuv lacked any, that the Yeshuv lacked enough proficient Arabic writers to embark on this wars, Jews and Jews who, who actually were born in Palestine um, and lived outside of Palestine would be recruited for these jobs. Nisim and Malul and Shimon Moyal was among them. What is crucial to understand is that it was their experience abroad 
where, where they discovered local nationalisms in which Jews were able to integrate, limited their understandings of the Palestinian staunch opposition to Zionism. Another point that needs to be highlighted is that the Arabic newspaper established by Shimon and his wife Esther, originally from Beirut, Esther Moel, south of Osmania, was not a newspaper for the Arabic reading Jewish public, but rather a paper written by Jews for non-Jewish, for Arab non-Jewish consumption, consumption. It too was part of the conquest of the Arab press. My article looks how despite Moel's familiar, familiarness with the urban Arab population, whether in Jaffa or Cairo, he seems to have little contact with rural Arabs, similar to the Sephardic community at large. And this work also speculates how both Shimon and Esther were sidelined in Palestine, unable to infiltrate the local press, um, even though they maintained good ties with Cairo and Beirut press outlets. On that note, what has not been noted before was Esther Moal was also, um, as a woman, must have found herself as somewhat of an outsider where there was limited visibility of women within the local uh, Jewish press in Palestine. Uh, including the Arabic press as well, very different from Cairo and Beirut. While I would be happy to answer questions later about Albert and Tebi and Avraham El Maliach and how this paper transforms, you know, the current work transform, transforms our understanding of the roles in the Yeshuv, I will end by discussing briefly the establishment of Hamagin, the Chil, which has been portrayed, an organization which has been portrayed in much of the scholarship as, as one that would build bridges with the local Arab, local Arab population. However, my work shows that its main purpose was to continue the war on the Arab press, the, the conquest of the Arab press. Perhaps ironically, the emphasis on the shared homeland synthesis has led us to miss out on the centrality of this group of Arab Jews to the history of the Jewish Yeshuv and how the new borders in the Middle East would greatly change the dynamics of a community that once could thrive in Cairo and Istanbul. No less important, however, is the realization that the political divisions between the group of Arab Jews in Palestine and the Palestinians were more profound than previously accepted, uh, understood. Ironically, it might have been Ottomanism and Egyptian nationalism that limited their ability to understand that Palestinian local patriotism, which was not, was not motivated by anti-Semitism, had genu genuine claims vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish issue. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, thank you, Louis. Um, so yes, you put in front of the discussion the, the issue of, of spoken language, uh, Hebrew, Arabic, and, and, and so on uh, in, the, in the Ottoman period. Uh, this issue of spoken language is, is a very long-term and structural, structural issue. And Sarah will, uh, will speak about a very specific and punctual moment, which is the, the 1927 Palestine earthquake and what what could be what could you could be read uh, through this uh, event uh, so sarah you have the uh, you 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 can speak now and i i ask everybody try to yes to 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 keep the four 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 minutes four minute and a half uh, maximum uh, uh, intervention sarah please thank you very much um it's wonderful but also very strange to be in an event where there are people sitting next to other people to whom they are not married or <laughs> parental or something like this. It's almost slightly shocking after almost a year and a half of all of this, but, but slightly encouraging as well. Um, so I'm, yes, I'm not going to speak in depth about the contents of my article. Um, if people are interested in it, um, it's in the journal um, and it's open access. Fantastic. Um, but I wanted to draw out a few of the kind of themes that I think are found in Louis' article, in the issue generally, um, and in um, Avner and Vincent's uh, introduction. So I very much appreciated the comment that I can't remember if it was Avner or Vincent um, made about this not being a rose tinted set of images of. Jewish Arab relations throughout the 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 issue, um, and 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 that obviously comes through in particularly uh, Louis's critique of the way in which, to some extent, people like Malul 
and the Moyals and Antebi have been seen in some cases as being a slightly kind of utopian um, kind of set of, of figures uh, in, in, in terms of cross-cultural interaction. Um, and I think what that kind of bears upon in terms of my own article, which looks at the ways in which um, the Safadi community in Jerusalem in particular were affected by the 1927 earthquake um, and how they responded to that in terms of trying to uh, draw down funds from various fundraising efforts to repair not only homes but also their um, public buildings, so um, uh, synagogues and, and yeshivot. Um, and so I think one of the kind of key points that comes out of this to some extent is the extent to which identity and community membership aren't always voluntary. Um, they're not always a matter, although they're often talked about, especially if we're kind of in more literary studies and things like this, as being um, a matter of, uh, of an internal process. Um, in fact, often they are often imposed uh, and in the case of, of, of my study, imposed by the colonial attitudes of the mandate regime and how governmental processes are at cross purposes with, pe with people's individual perceptions of themselves and their wider relationships um, across the Jewish world um, and elsewhere. Um, I think one of the other points which I think Vincent you raised in, in, in one of the emails about this event was the question of continuities that I think also uh, ties in both Louise and my papers. So one of my arguments is that one of the problems that the Sephardic community uh, encounter at this, at this moment that I'm talking about is in some places continuity into a pre-World War I mindset or, or to do with relationships um, and encounters and that being cut off very clearly and directly by the British mandate authorities and again the, the, the racialized attitudes that they impose on Arabs in different ways and on Jews in different ways. So it's not so much a matter of the experience of Jews and Arabs in terms of how they encounter but how they are both uh, imposed upon by British attitudes. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say very briefly, um, uh, the, the introduction mentioned um, the question of archives. Um, this is the first paper, um, uh, I'm very happy to say, of, uh, um, of a three year project, which I started, oh, about two months before lockdown began. Um, so obviously it's it's been one of those processes of oh my God, I have three years to work on this material and the first year of it has, has been in a place where none of us can actually go anywhere. Um, I was extremely lucky in that I spent one week in London of those two months just before lockdown and came out of that week with 10,000 archive images. And that allowed me to work on this. Um, but I think that kind of little experience does speak to some extent of the kind of challenges that um, pandemic has meant for probably all of us in terms of the archives that we can and can't access and hope but hopefully um, and, and to be a little bit optimistic which is most uncharacteristic for me um, that this might also be a kind of turning point in terms of thinking a bit more differently about how archives are accessed about digitization and also about kind of sharing the archive access that we that, that, that each of us have had um, in order to kind of permit as many of us to access as many different bits of archive as we all can. And that's me done. Thank you, Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, you can imagine how the, the archival issue is important for us and, and, and for me and, and for ev everyone here. And uh, Avner will, yes, we'll uh, introduce the question of the laser spot. We'll see if it's more Pink or less, I don't know. <laughs> yes, uh, so the next team is the team of uh, leisure, which is, um, of course, a classical theme of cultural history. And in our uh, special issue, there are two 
articles on places of leisure, uh, one article on the cinema, uh, cinema places in Jerusalem, uh, another article on beaches in Haifa. And the question is, of course, always, uh, were these places of uh, encounter, of peaceful coexistence between Jews and Arabs, or were the places of uh, conflict, um, uh, war zone, or uh, maybe uh, both? So we're going to hear about them uh, first from uh, Judith Oppenheimer, uh, the director of the Amim, whose article is on the uh, cinemas of Jerusalem, and then from uh, Mayan Hillel of North Western University, whose article is on the beaches of Haifa. Um, Judith, please. Little like that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay. uh, should I look this way? Yeah, you look. Ah. <laughs> okay. Look into the, no. in, into the uh... yeah. okay. Thank you, Avner. Uh, Avner, like you said, my uh, article focuses on uh, uh, the cinemas in, uh, at the center of Jerusalem, uh, and particularly on Zion Cinema at the center of Jerusalem. And by its name, uh, Zion Cinema already uh, contains, uh, contains uh, a duality between, uh, between the world of cinema, modernism, urban development, and Zionism as a name that reflects a national movement, a national movement with a specific national aspiration that we know that eventually led, develop, evolved into, into a conflict. But early in, the, early in the 1920s and into the 1930s, and even at the middle of the 19, uh, 1940s, the cinemas at the center of Jerusalem, and particularly Zion Cinema, is the center of urban development and the center of shared urban development. So let me first uh, define the center of Jerusalem. So uh, modern Jerusalem developed outside of the old city, at, outside of Jaffa Gate, along what was known to be a uh, Jaffa Road slope or Jaffa, Jaffa Slope, which is the part of Jaffa Road adjacent to, to Jaffa Gate. But during the British mandatory time, West, uh, sorry, the center, the urban center of Jerusalem was moved by efforts made by the by the Brits and also by, to, by uh, the Zionist movement to the center of Jaffa, of the, of Jaffa world, but was moved west and west and, and was made more distinct from, from, the, uh, uh, from the, the old city. But nevertheless, this new center of Jerusalem at the middle of Jaffa world, in, the, in this interjunction between King George Street and, a new, and Benny Huda Street, both brand new streets have during the British mandatory time, where the center of Jerusalem was created, the cinemas, and particularly Zion Cinema, were very much the center of urban development. It is very typical also of urban development in Palestine as a whole. They, uh, uh, the, the main square in the in the in, in the cities of, of Palestine were not were not centered around a, a beautiful fountain or a monument, but rather the cinemas were were created a, a kind of a, a, a urban a action, urban happening around them, and eventually squares develop uh, around them and receive the name of the of the cinemas. So if we look at cinema cinema uh, uh, at the cin cinema uh, square, it received its name from the cinema, again reflecting this duality between modern development and a national a national movement if we judge by the uh, accounts that the many many accounts of uh, uh, that are reflected in in diaries of the time both of jews and of uh, uh, and of arabs we see that the names was was actually a very minor 
to the uh, uh, to the rich activity, urban activity that that developed around and, and inside uh, uh, Zion cinema, very much reflect uh, uh, reflecting what was already said here many times, and I believe will be said in uh, uh, in, in these meetings about. Uh, Another history that developed very much in parallel with the more the more uh, uh, the political history, the high history of of two conf two national movements in co uh, in in conflict. There was this shared life of Jerusalem in which uh, in in which both Arabs and Jews uh, so uh, uh, were meeting in the cinema. And not only uh, uh, seeing each other as uh, as residents, as members of the same urban uh, society, urban community, actually participating in a growing, in a developing uh, uh, urban urban community, and also experience something very new to the to the era, and very much connecting them to the world, to the uh, to modernity, to technology. To there was something very magnificent about um, about movies and very new, and it connected uh, uh, Jews and Arabs together. Zion Square, Zion Cinema, as well as a, as a, um, um, other cinemas in in at the center of Jerusalem at the time were not only uh, the the where, where film was screened, but also they were the hub of cultural activities uh, in the in the city, uh, Zion Cinema and also other cinemas as well. Uh, but particularly Zion Cinema was the home for theater performances, for for opera. Uh, in which both again Arabs and Jews uh, uh, participated, uh, also for political events, for political gatherings. They were all held inside, indoor, in the in the in the in the cinema halls, and they were they could be very different from one another, and yet they were held uh, at the same time. Cinemas were also sometimes a, a result of a, a, of joint. Commercial enterprise between between uh, uh, Arabs uh, and Jews. So the interaction between Jews and Arabs around the around uh, the cinema activities uh, uh, was very rich and very 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 diverse and bringing together Jews and Arabs. But towards towards the uh, 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 the late in, in the middle of the of the uh, 1930s, since the uh, re, um, outbreak of the Arab Revolt, we could see how also cinemas turn into uh, hubs of frictions with several uh, terror attacks at at the cinemas in East Jerusalem. Uh, sorry, I'm used to speaking about this Jerusalem in in at the center of uh, 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 of Jerusalem. And surprisingly, so Zion Cinema, with its peculiar name, was not the center of these terror attacks. Uh, rather, the Edison, uh, with the, this more universal uh, aspiration, uh, uh, Orions, uh, uh, and, and other, but definitely marking that these hubs of, of communication, of, of gather, of, of, of a, a shared urban life. Once the conflict became more acute, were also uh, uh, sites of attacks, uh, of some uh, of some uh, severe attacks, and even the beginning of the 1948 uh, war started at the at an Arab uh, with an Arab attack on the Mamila uh, shopping center, immediately reciprocated by the Etzel underground uh, attack on the Rex uh, cinema. Uh, the cinema, the only cinema at the center of Jerusalem, which was owned by, by an Arab, uh, um, uh, Joseph Albina, and the flames, the picture of the Zion, the Zion cinema, uh, uh, the flame going out of Zion cinema, are very much the symbol of this war. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you, Judith. Uh, so places of leisure are always places of contact, uh, but the nature of the contact, of course, varies uh, over the time. Uh, now to the other place of contact, uh, the beaches of Haifa. Uh, Mayan, please. Thank you very much, Edner, and thank you very much, Vincent. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening to those who are in Jerusalem. Um, I'm very happy that I had the opportunity to contribute to this wonderful and important issue, and I'm very happy also to participate in this exciting round. So in the few minutes I have, I will briefly uh, present the main arguments of my article. So in general, uh, the article examines daily encounters between ordinary Jews and Arabs on uh, the beaches of mandatory Haifa, as uh, Avner just uh, said. The article uh, is basically a part of a, a larger research project which discusses the emergence and expansion of a modern and commercial leisure culture in Arab-Palestinian society during the British Mandate uh, period. Now, major part of this research focuses on daily interactions and cultural cooperation between Jews and Arabs in different uh, leisure arenas, while aiming to uncover the mutual influences and uh, multi-layered implications of the intercultural encounter between uh, the two societies. So uh, in this specific article, I've chosen to focus on beaches uh, since during that time, they became a highly popular leisure site, uh, while other recreational uh, commercial sites were quite costly, beaches provided an accessible public leisure space that drew people from all walks of life of both Jewish and Arab uh, communities. And the article first uh, points out the development of a uh, high-tech beaches from late 19th century to uh, 1948, and then moves to examine two types of uh, interactions between Jews and Arabs, concrete and model interaction. So in the part of the concrete interaction, uh, the article indicates that beaches functioned as a neutral space where Arabs and Jews uh, chose to spend their free time together or side by side, notwithstanding their commitment and awareness of the national cause. The tremendous popularity of the seashore at that time made the visit there a trivial, mundane, and legitimate practice. So the article shows that the decision to spend time at a specific beach stemmed from a personal choice based on preference and style and for the most part was detached from a political uh, sentiment. Now, in addition, uh, the, concrete, uh, the concrete interaction also point out the flowing and exchange of cultural norms between the two societies, as it was evident, for example, in gender changes and the Palestinian women's presence at the beaches, among other things. Now, alongside the analysis of uh, the concrete interactions between uh, individuals, the article also looks into a more abstract dimension of interaction, which Bauch Kimmerling termed model interaction. Um, as part of, of that, uh, Jewish and Arab societies constantly observed one another at the collective uh, level, and each examines the other's cultural activities. In other words, the cultural and leisure life of each community constituted a subject for conscious or unconscious observation, comparison, and competition for its counterpart. In that sense, both the Palestinian and the Hebrew press, for instance, closely observed what was going on in the other, uh, in the other society's leisure life, and specifically looked at what was happening at its uh, beaches. Now, prominent figures from uh, two societies criticized the cultural life of the neighboring community and even denounced their youth who visited the other side's leisure site. But at the same time, uh, they also called for imitation and adoption of infrastructures or forms of leisure of the neighboring community. So basically, as a result of their encounter, each society accelerated internal processes of cultural development. 
So the bottom line of the article is that the physical proximity between the two societies under the context of a national conflict created a complex reality characterized on one hand by clear pattern of a cultural attraction, curiosity, imitation, and adoption. And on the other hand, by a tendency toward competition, condemnation, rejection, and a desire for seclusion and segregation. So these insights reveals that the cultural lives of Arabs and Jews in mandatory Palestine were inseparably interlinked and that they had a significant mutual influence on one another. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marianne. We are moving now to the uh, other team, main team of the uh, special issue, which is also a classical team of cultural history, which is art. But art uh, seen not through uh, the aesthetic uh, lenses, but art with an emphasis on um, social and uh, political, the political and social dimensions uh, of the field. Uh, there are three different articles that um, speak about three different artistic fields, poetry, music, and theater. Uh, the first article by uh, Kobe Pellet about uh, Bedouin poetry, second article by uh, Didier Francfort on uh, Jewish Arab Oriental music, and the third article by Emmanuel Thiebaud on the Janin Freedom Theatre. Uh, the first speaker, uh, Kobi Pellet from Ben-Gurion University. Please, Kobi. Thank you so much. Uh, I envy you that you're there in this uh, beautiful building in Jerusalem. I remember this building many years ago. I think it was the seat of the British Council. It has an interesting history. Uh, so I wish I could be there, but I'm located, as uh, Avner said, in, uh, uh, in the Negev, in uh, Midrash Ben-Gurion, in Sede Boker. Uh, and I'm, I was lucky enough to uh, have um, um, these materials, uh, Bedouin poetry, with me. So if I refer to what Avner and uh, Vincent uh, earlier said about uh, uh, cultural history, then I think it is best that I focus on the issue of sources, uh, archival sources ver versus uh, uh, oral testimonies. So I've always felt, I think, that uh, there is some disproportion between uh, the documentation on, on behalf of uh, the Jewish side and uh, the, the documentation of the uh, historical events and processes on the Palestinian Arab side. And uh, I was interested in this, uh, uh, in the gap and in the relations between uh, written evidence and, and oral testimonies. So we know uh, quite a lot about how Jews perceived and understood Palestinian Arabs. And I feel that uh, we know quite, uh, I mean, very little, I think, at least I know very little about how Palestinian Arabs uh, view Jews in, 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 in the past. Um, and I think in, in a sense for me, the paper is some kind of a corrective uh, history on, on the relation between the, the groups. I, I try to see how uh, Bedouin uh, quite often neglected out of the discourse, even out of the Palestinian Arab narrative, how they viewed the Jews. So I, ha I have been lucky to, uh, as I said, have this uh, um, collection of Bedouin uh, poetry um, amassed by an interesting figure called Sasson Bartzvi. He was born in Jerusalem. Uh, the family of, uh, I mean, his, his grandparents came from Basra, from today's Iraq. Um, an interesting figure. Uh, with complex relations with the Bedouin. He was a military government, an intelligence uh, um, official, um, uh, high official in uh, 
באר שבע המוניסיפליטי, ‫אבל הוא היה קפטיבטד, ‫אני יכול להגיד, ‫בדואין פורטרי. ‫ואז הוא קולקטד בדואין פורמס ‫מהרבה פריאדים, ‫דייטינג בק למיד... 19th century and until uh, the, the, the mid 1980s uh, and I tried to follow uh, his uh, the, collect the, the poems he collected and to try and see how the representation of the Jews uh, changed throughout time and basically from the 30s till the 80s I won't go now into detail but uh, trying to sum up what I found I think Through uh, the poetics of the Bedouin, I found that the, the Bedouin uh, popular poetry, of course, the Bedouin poets uh, quite quickly understood the changes in uh, uh, structure of power, the, the new power relations, uh, and they had quite a lot of things to say about uh, these power relations. They always said these things very uh, ironically, humoristically, And there's an interesting combination in one they in, in, in their poetry in the, in the poetic uh, means they use between uh, being very cautious and careful for various reason, various reasons and, 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 and for being and on, on the one hand and being very daring uh, and precise on the other one. So that's my four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Kobe. Uh... We can see how language is always uh, coming back and uh, being very important for all these uh, various sorts of interactions. And it will come again in one of the um, uh, last paper I already anticipate on the uh, poets who uh, translated each other uh, in the 50s in Israel. But First to the uh, next uh, speaker, Didier Frankfog from Lorraine uh, University on Jewish Arab Oriental music in Israel in the 50s. Please, Didier. Thank you. Thank you, Abner. Um, very often music is considered as, as something common, uh, usually better than language. When language divided, Uh, music put together and I would like to, to say in my article I, I didn't find it very easily. Music can be a way to keep the, the, the divided societies. Uh, it, it's the first time I work on uh, Israeli music. Uh, very often I, I worked about music in the, build, the building of the nations or in circulation, cultural, cultural circulation and I wanted to try the methods I used for European matters in uh, Palestinian Israeli matters to, to know how music can be uh, something common or something different. And uh, I had, when I began the, the work, maybe the pink perspective, uh, Vincent referred uh, of something uh, with a very happy end that was with the Oslo Accords of uh, 93, the way uh, musicians like um, uh, Yair Dalal uh, put together uh, Palestinian music and Israeli music in a very harmonic way to use music for the peace process. But unfortunately, what I found when I, when I worked was something different. Uh, for instance, I discovered uh, something strange in the um, a ceremony uh, of, uh, um, dedicated to the memory of the singer uh, Zohar Argoff. The singer was called the king of popular music uh, in Israel society. Uh, and uh, after his death, it's considered something like, like a, a, an idol of the society. And uh, in the 97, there was, um, a ceremony dedicated, a concert dedicated to his, his memory, and uh, the politician um, um, Ehud Barak came and say, uh, I love Oriental music, I love Mizrahi music. I'm not here as a politician, I'm here as some, somebody really loving 
the, all the music, the Arab music from Egypt, uh, Um Kulthum, etc. And uh, the people in the audience uh, whistle to say, stop, we don't want to hear that kind of uh, speech. We just want to hear Arab music. We just want to hear Mizrahi music, but no speech about the peace process, no speech about politics. And uh, that was the same feeling I had when I, I was lucky to, to talk with uh, the, the uh, musician Tom Cohen, who was leading the orchestra of uh, Jerusalem West and East. And he told me, when I play, I cannot say anything about politics. Uh, when I, I, I say music can uh, put us together, uh, my audience say, halas, stop, don't talk. But I think it's in, in Arab, they say, stop. We don't want to hear something about the possibility that music can put us together. Uh, so in the article, I, I tried to use all kinds of music to try to understand the way the circulation of music, the proximity of music can be interpreted in political very different positions, in political very different uh, attitudes in, the, in front of the uh, opposition, the conflict or the peace process. And um, maybe I can tell you can all of you hear all the sources because uh, when uh, I decided to try to propose something for the special issue, uh, Avner told me, but how can you find sources uh, when you, you, could, you cannot travel and go to archives? And I said, well, I'm sure we can find sources because we have the opportunity with internet to find all that kind of music. And uh, I gathered, all the sources on um, the YouTube channel uh, uh, when I, where I work. It's called Histoire Culturelle. And you have there more than 150 items of music. That's the proof that you have a great number, a great number of uh, proofs of the musical circulation, but it doesn't mean there is something that is on the good way to uh, real, real cultural dialogue with that music. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Didier. And indeed, you were correct. Uh, miracles do happen, and you can find sources um, also on the internet. Um, with the next uh, speaker, we move to the occupied uh, Palestinian uh, territories and to the uh, field of theater. Again, uh, cooperation and also, um, I would say, animosity around theatrical projects, Jews and Arabs. Um, Emmanuel uh, Thiebaud, uh, University of Caen. Emmanuel, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So before presenting the article itself, I propose to explain briefly what led me to write it. I learned about the existence of the Freedom Theatre in Jenin in 2012, while conducting an ethnographic immersion survey among French activist associations supporting Palestinian people through art and culture. I was preparing a PhD about the theatrical representation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in France. And the general problematic of this work questioned the artistic legitimacies on the French stages. So I asked, how is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict represented on the French stages? In a very synthetic way, the most recognized productions often present it as a tragedy. But on the fringe stages, uh, breaking with the hegemonic media discourses, Israeli and Palestinian artists were giving different represent representations. 
And this is how I became interested uh, in artists from the region whose shows were hosted in France and in tracing the genesis of these companies. That is what I propose in my article, which looks back at the educational and artistic practices of Arna Mechamis and his son Giuliano in the Jenin camp from the 80s to nowadays. So these studies intends to go beyond the media figure of Giuliano Mechamis, whose murder in front of the theater in 2011 was highly publicized. Um, my study shows two things. First, the difficulties of reconstructing the genesis of this theater remotely. Because all the sources I gathered are situated and ideologically charged, yet a coherence emerges that allows us to account for a part for the reality of the reality. And secondly, it shows that the Freedom Theater is a fruit of a Jewish Arab cooperation that could only exist concretely thanks to a mutual commitment protected, protecting it on the one hand from the Israeli army and on the other hand from religious or political groups hostile to its presence in the camp. Um, this, uh, this study shows the complexity of this cultural resistance. It is far for, from being utopian. The Freedom Theater tries to articulate the, its position between national liberation movement and universalist revolution. This dim dimension is little uh, emphasized by in the media, which relays a spectacle of violence. Finally, my study is more an introduction to the Freedom Theater, which is essential to understand its cultural productions, which are briefly mentioned. And um, I am aware that I wrote this article with the intention of highlighting a little known Palestinian theater. And I in invite the readership to learn about the theater's current events and activities. Um, such as the uh, Freedom Bus that uh, have been uh, crossing the West Bank since 2012 in reference to the African American Freedom Rides for Civil Rights in the 70s. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, well, it seems that this term, uh, cultural resistance, it's, uh, is another term that we should. Uh, take into consideration when we think about uh, cultural history and the implication of culture uh, for any kind of change, uh, social uh, or political. Uh, for the last uh, team, uh, back to Vincent, please. Thank you. And so, yes, finally, maybe we, we are coming back to this uh, alternative between optimistic versus uh, pessimistic uh, perspective. And so we, we choose to, to, to put this title in front of the discussion. Uh, uh, the question of the rendezvous manqué, missed rendezvous, missed two opportunities. And maybe it's possible to modify the question that we, we put on the table at the beginning of this meeting. Maybe it's possible to talk less about the failures versus successes uh, uh, of these histories and to talk more about the potentialities of these failures and or uh, successes. And for this um, question, we will uh, hear uh, Ayelet Bechar and Sadia Axus. And I think I let you, you start this computer because Ayelet is here in Jerusalem with the CRG. Please. Thank you very much. and. Uh... First, thank you, uh, Vincent and Avner, especially Avner, for uh, supporting this uh, research uh, with such, such a devotion. Um, and thank you also, Emmanuel, for talking about the intersection between universalist revolution and uh, national liberation movement. 
because I feel in a way the story that I'm about to talk about uh, has to do with this uh, intersection. Uh, my research um, was focusing on a very unusual uh, initiative called the Arab Pioneer Youth. Uh, it's a youth movement uh, where young Arabs were invited to live in Jewish kibbutzim just to establish how unusual it is, one minute of background. Uh, it started in 1951. It was only three years after the establishment of the State of Israel and the Palestinian uh, Nakba. And during these first years of the state, uh, there was military rule imposed on the Arabs who remained in Israel and became its citizens. And the Palestinian farming land was, called, was being confiscated. Uh, and in general, uh, there was very little access to education, employment, and even food for these Palestinians who stayed behind. Uh, while at the same time, uh, the Jewish population had grown immensely with huge waves of, of uh, immigration. And the Jewish uh, Zionist settlement movement was uh, really at its uh, peak. Uh, and leading this settlement movement were the kibbutzim, and in particular, those who belonged to Hashomer Atzair, literally meaning young guard movement. It started as a youth movement, but it was also connected to a settlement movement and later to a political party. Hashomer Atzair was idealistic, it was socialist, it was communal, uh, and it operated under the slogan, Zionism, Socialism, and the Brotherhood of Nations. And here is that intersection, uh, which uh, has the contradiction in it. Uh, so Hashomer Hatzair decided to uh, offer young Arabs uh, a chance to enter the kibbutz, to live in it, to study, to work in kibbutzim. So between 1951 and 1961, uh, more than 1,800 uh, young Arabs, mostly men, there were really very little women in this movement, uh, so it's a male story. Uh, all these people had joined uh, the movement called the Pioneer Arab Youth and lived in Kibbutzim. By the way, the poster uh, that is in the invitation for uh, this uh, event and also in the um, in the article uh, shows uh, the blue shirt, which is the Hashem uh, uniform, uh, with a kafia, the Arab kafia, the traditional dress, a red flag and the Israeli flag. Uh, so you can see visually uh, these depictions of the different um, identities in this poster. Um, so you can, of course, read in the article uh, many more uh, details. Uh, however, uh, this is a story of, of shattered dreams, of great hopes, of a vision, and of uh, the eventual uh, failure. Uh, I can give one example. Uh, the research uh, is based on uh, interviews which I was lucky enough to conduct in the last uh, 10, even 12 years, uh, and also memoirs uh, and diaries and uh, reports and protocols. Um, so take, for example, Ahmad Masawe. Ahmad was only 14 uh, when a representative of the kibbutz came to his uh, home in the farming village of Arara and basically made his parents an offer they couldn't refuse. Uh, let us uh, take Ahmad to the kibbutz and he will spend his adolescent years, the next four years of his life from 14 to 18 with us in the kibbutz. Uh, Ahmad was quite bright. Uh, there was no school in the, in the village and they didn't have money to send him away. There was barely bread. Uh, military rule, no option uh, really to, to work. Uh, his prospects weren't uh, very bright and he moved to the kibbutz. The first thing that happened, according to his account, was that the counselor gave him a new Hebrew name, Svi, and uh, he started to study the basics of socialism uh, and general studies and he danced folk dances, okay. hora, holding hands with the girls, which was very exciting for him at the time, very unusual for a young Muslim from the village. And he also learned a trade. Uh, he worked as a carpenter uh, and even lost one of his uh, fingers in an accident. Uh, he felt a very deep connection to this land that he was farming through the farming. Uh, and he also felt very protected in the kibbutz because the leaders of the kibbutz had protected him from military rule physically with their bodies. It was illegal for him to be there and the kibbutz protected him. So he felt at home. But at the same time, he started having doubts. He discovered uh, that he was living on the ruins, literally on the ruins of uh, pre-1948 uh, Palestinian villages taken over by the kibbutz. And he had realized that these people were forced into to exile. And he also realized that uh, some of the people he was, who, he, whom he was uh, meeting in the kibbutz uh, were military commanders in the 1948 uh, war. Uh, so he started feeling uh, uneasy. 
At the same time, he really believed this idea and he had this dream to become a kibbutz member or to start his own kibbutz. So he started working on starting an Arab kibbutz. Uh, he thought he would be given some of the confiscated lands of his own village to start the kibbutz. Uh, but then he recalls being told, Ahmad, don't be naive. On the land of your village, we will set up three new Jewish settlements which will take arms if need be. Uh, so as you can imagine, there was no kibbutz. Uh, he returned to his village uh, and soon went to Tel Aviv to work in construction. At the time, military rule had already eased the restrictions. Uh, and the kibbutz dream was over. I have to say that Ahmad believes in it to this day. Uh, however, uh, the movement uh, stopped being stopped being active uh, in 1961 and maybe a little bit uh, later, um, and it became a thing of the past, uh, still representing, I think, a hope for some bridge to Jewish Arab peace, maybe to reconcile socialism with the Brotherhood of Nations and Zionism. But I think we learned that uh, Zionism uh, comes first, and even though uh, this movement changed the lives of everyone involved, but eventually they failed completely. Thank you. Thank you, Ayelet. Uh, I think we will uh, stay in this uh, 50s, uh, this years of the, the, the 50s uh, with um, Sadia uh, Axus uh, Bienstein. And I think we will come back to the issue of the languages because I know that Sadia, you are deeply involved in this question. and. Maybe the first question and the last one is in which language these people are talking or not talking or are agree or disagree. Uh, Sadia, please. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm not going to, to go into details about the article. Um, people can read it, but um, um, a question of language. Of course, they would exchange in Arabic. I mean, between the Iraqi with the Palestinian, they would exchange in Arabic, and then Hebrew will be like the adding and the top language. Um, I just want to, in four minutes, to explain the back background of this uh, article, which is like a larger project. Um, in 1966, uh, Hassan Kanafani writes a pamphlet called Adab al muqawama fi Palestine, okay, from 1948-1966. So Adab al muqawama is literature of resistance. Just to, it's interesting that Avner just raised the question of resistance. Then he was talking in this book about, um, and then he, he, he published in 67 another um, an updated issue. But in this book, he talks about, um, um, how Palestinian Arabic culture resisted in the Galilee, right? And he gives names of poet, of theater uh, uh, writers, and also writers of short stories. Why I'm talking about Kanafani? When I read Kanafani, I saw in the uh, uh, I saw that he gave references of how La Maze, this leftist newspaper, right? And I knew that Kanafani did not speak Hebrew because when Kanafani was expelled from Palestine, he was a kid. So I was wondering who translated for him, right? So I went to Beirut and did some research and tried to look who the hell translated for Kanafani and for Yasser Arafat and for all the Palestinian um, leaders who were um, um, in Beirut at the time. So I discovered there was a group of Palestinians from Israel who used to be Israelis and who moved, um, went into exile from the end of the 60s to the 70s. And they set up even classes of Hebrew to train Hebrew translators. So like today, uh, um, the Institute for Palestine Studies, they have what they call the blue flyer, which is a translation of resume of the, the main articles of the Israeli newspapers. And yes, our Fed had every day a report of what happened within the Hebrew Israeli uh, newspapers. So this is that I was going to start with the language that you asked me um, uh, about this one. Um, and among these people that you had Rashid Hussein, Although Rashid Hussein moved between Syria and Beirut and then finished in New York and died in New York. But yeah, Rashid Hussein was among this um, group of Palestinians 
like Darwish and others who moved to Beirut and other Arab countries and translated also from Hebrew. So I wanted to, in this article actually, to give a central role to Rashid Hussein that um, we have a lot of research done on the Mizrahim, on Sassoul Somer, and what they did. Uh, but Rashid Hassin was um, very important because he tried in the 50s to organize this meeting with um, Israeli intellectuals and writers that did not um, that did not succeed, that failed, right? But at the same time, uh, and I explained the article, it failed because the same people who took part in this meeting they took part in 1948 Nakba. So um, there was like a gap already, political gap, um, and in the political role between these in Israeli intellectuals and the Palestinians who were there, among them was Hannah Bohanna and Rashid Hassin. Um, and then on the Sasson um, Somach, I wanted to also, what I understood from all this research through Cairo, Beirut, and uh, Palestine, Israel. But what I understood is that there was an occasion actually between Jews and Palestinians to work together, but through the Arabic culture. And the Jews, these Jews were the Jews who came from Arab countries, and most of them were from Iraq. And Sasson Somer was uh, one of them. When Sasson Somer is really touching to read his autobiography because he explains, you know, when I got to Palestine, I wanted to hear Arabic, I wanted to read Arabic. So they took him into a tour to Nazareth in the bus. And then he got there and, and then the, the, he decided to come by himself and just go and look for Arab books. And he looked for Arab books and he met intele Palestinian intellectuals. He was invited in their homes and he talked about private libraries and they opened to me private libraries. And this is how he had access the first time for Arabic literature uh, or at least what it was left as Arabic literature um, and Palestinian literature in Israel in at that period in the fifties. So the, the thing is that um, the main point is that there was really uh, a possibility of an encounter, a cultural encounter between um, Mizrahim, Arab Jews and, and Palestinian, but it failed because the Mizrahim were also on the margin of the Israeli society. So they didn't have this political power, um, intellectual power that other, um, um, intellectuals were from European descent uh, or Ashkenazim, they didn't have that in order for this um, encounter to go uh, further. Um, so I'd like to just to finish with two points because you raised in your presentation the question of um, the question of archives. And now, first of all, just to finish with that, um, in Saraj al Huli, this is one of the book of Emil Habibi, and it's actually his memoir. And he spoke a lot in this book about his relationship with the Mizrahi with Arab Jews. And he said, um, Habibi said, the thing that saved me was fishing, right? I remember in uh, Said Mutashail, he, he talks a lot about the fish who spoke a few languages, Arabic and Hebrew and other languages. And he says, fishing saved my life. And, uh, and the thing that I'm sharing now with the, uh, Abna al -Am, Abna al -Am are the cousins, and he talks about the Jews and the Arab Jews is fishing. So they decided to go fishing. And he says, I'm not the only Palestinian who goes fishing. A lot of people like me go fishing in order to go away and um, um, away far from the oppressive political situation. But we do that also with Arab Jews with one condition, we don't talk about politics, but we talk about fishing, right? So just to finish on the question of archives, um, the question of archive is really important. And, um, I had an exchange with Anton Shamas on um, other initiatives that took 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 like uh, uh, that um, existed in the 80s with Mifgash, uh, for example, and he says the problem is that nothing was kept, right? And it's not like um, it's not even sometimes possible to find uh, issues of journals journals that published. Um, reports or um, or poems in Hebrew and Arabic that went um, together with um, this meeting that were, that were organized. And finally, on the question of um, archives, I would say archives and subjectivity. The question of encounter between Palestinian and Israelis and what you raise in your introduction as um, uh, uh, la proche relationnelle, 
Um, I don't. I think that the Palestinians are working on it since like now a long time, and I'm thinking about Mana and Tamari, who Tamari wrote a beautiful article about Ishaq uh, uh from Hebron, who um, who uh, was the best maybe Hebrew writer that described the best the um, the society from uh, Al Khalil. Uh, or the Arabic society from Al Khalil, uh, Mana wrote uh, a beautiful article about the relationship of Sakakini uh, with his Jewish student and his relationship with Jews uh, during the uh, Ottoman period. Um, and what, um, just to finish, I'm sorry, I know it's four minutes, but um, I think what um, this new material is looked at, and this is what I would like to discuss also, from another point of view of subjectivity. Right, because you're always like you have the history, objective history and objectivity and so on. But today when we look at a lot of Palestinian who are looking at the history of their um, families and in within this history, we can look, we can see the encounter with the Jews like Isa, um, Isa also in his memoir that his um, granddaughter uh, published, uh, he has sections about his relationship with the Jews. So, and but the, what motivates also the grandchild to write about uh, this memoir is the question of subjectivity and the hidden history or the marginal history. And I think that maybe it's something that is new within the, this cultural history today uh, that reads photos, films, and other material that history maybe did not take into account for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sadia. I'm sure that uh, Menheim, uh, Menheim Klein uh, will speak about this question of objectivity, subjectivities. Menheim Klein is a professor of political science in uh, Barilan University, and his book, uh, Lives in Common, Arabs and Jews in Jerusalem, Jaffa and Hebron, was published in uh, 2014 uh, in Oxford. And it was one of the first book uh, of this new relational history of uh, Palestine slash Israel subjectivities, please, Menachem. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Amos. <clears throat> Thank you, all the presenters. Uh, some of you I know, you know, in person, not just <laughs> here in the cubes of the screen, of the computer screen. Um, I would like to wrap up, uh, to put these case studies in, in, the, in the context, OK, if I may. Uh, First of all, in my analysis, all these case studies and other uh, publications since uh, the, to the year 2000 creates uh, what I call new historians. And, and there is a trend of new historians that look beyond the conflict or not only on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and use the new, uh, not new, but put attention to other sources than those who were used by his political historians or the historians of, of, of the conflict. Now, it was mentioned uh, by Sarah, the, uh, the imperial context. And the, uh, the imperial context is, is very important, not only in the context of the British uh, the British rule in Palestine on the, in the, the, the uh, British imper uh, imperial colo uh, co colonialist uh, project, but also within the context of the Ottoman Empire. And the, uh, uh, the uh, Jewish Arab relations or the, uh, the Palestinian identity prior to the British occupation uh, is. Uh, uh, can be seen in the context of the Nahda, of the enlightenment uh, that was not only European project, but also in the East. Moving to the Jewish side, Arab Jews were part of the Nahda, of the enlightenment, not only German Jews, or West European Jews. This is brought up recently in other studies. So the, the context of Jewish Arab 
relations of the Arab Jews of the late Ottoman period, the right context to put it is the context of enlightenment, of modernization. Here, Jerusalem, of course, and then Jaffa and Haifa plays key key role in the uh, project of modernizing Palestine as part of modernization in the Ottoman Empire, of course. And afterwards, the uh, the context, uh, the imperial context, changed with the uh, British occupation and the introduction of the, the the British rule here in in Palestine. Now the uh, and another note that I would like to put here um, in the uh, on the table is the local patriotism. The Jewish uh, Jewish Arab encounter the context that I I think is is very important in, since the late 19th century up to to a, a 48 war is the local patriotism. Both Jews and Arabs were local patriots. Early on, let's say late 19th century, the local patriotism developed uh, in uh, here in and Abnail Balad. This is the name that the uh, Palestinians used to, or Arabs used to title uh, the, their uh, compatriots, the, the, the Jews. And the, 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 the Abnail Balad, or local patriotism, was not limited only to the Mizrahi Jews. Also, Alex, uh, Ashkenazi Jews were part of this local patriotism. Um, and the, 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 there was a local identity the prior to the introduction of ethnicity. The, uh, the two main powers that introduced ethnicity were Zionism and the British imperialism. Um, and, and they cooperated, um, of course, um, they cooperated. And so the nation building project of the national movement, movements, sorry, the, both Zionism and the Palestinian national movement was not just a nation building project. It was also a destructive, a divide, the, the divisive project of dividing the Jews from the Arabs. This was the Zionist aim of exclusive uh, sovereignty, exclusive belonging claim to the land as well. And the reaction was the Palestinian mirror image, of course. So the uh, nation building project, this is something that the, that the uh, official historiography, the Zionist official historiography, and also the Palestinian uh, mainstream historiography tend to forget and to ignore that the nation building project was also a, de a divisive, uh, divisive project of forgetting the joint local patriotism. Uh, and it has its, it, its consequences also later on, post-48, of course, <clears throat> when the, the culture of the Arab Jews was denied or they were asked to convert to become Zionist and local patriots, according to the Ashkenazi ruling elite Zionist version. It, the, the, uh, the consequences we can see it up to date by, by the popular title of Mizrahi Jews, the Oriental Jews, rather than Arab Jews. To, to, uh, they prefer to title themselves Mizrahi, as you know, also in, India is also in the East, and Japan is in the East, but they, are, but they, have, they, they have nothing to do with, uh, <clears throat> with this Orient. It means escaping the title Arab Jews, but their culture was uh, Arab and still is Arab with some influence. I can see it in music of Mediterranean music, uh, Greece, Turkey, and so on. But, uh, but, but uh, we can see it uh, up to date that the denial of the Palestinian narrative, the denial of the Palestinian belonging to the land, the denial of the 
uh, of the lo lo of Arabs as local patriots, as natives of this this land, has its uh, uh, impact over the Arab Jews, second, third generation of immigrants from Arab countries. They came here with their own uh, uh, culture, which was the uh, Arab culture. So uh, the uh, uh, finally, uh, to, I would like to relate to what you put earlier regarding the um, pessimism, optimism, okay? Um, I do think that there is a chance to be, uh, there is a, a, gro a, a ground to, to, ba to, to base on our optimism, which is we can have a different future if we build a joint local patriotism. We, uh, <clears throat> we acknowledge, we I say the Jews or the ruling power, the, Israel, the uh, Israeli ruling power, we acknowledge the local patriotism and the, the native belonging and identity of the Palestinian Arabs and build a joint uh, local patriotism, um, let's say downgrading ethnicity and upgrading local patriotism and belonging to the land. That the two ethnic groups belong to the land and they should not be divided ethnic, eth ethnically, uh, but rather share the belonging here uh, to, to the land. It, it, this, this is the base for having a different future. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you so Thank much, you. Menachem. It's, uh, it's just two minutes past uh, seven. Uh, in half, and maybe there is 10 minutes for discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I, I just want to ask the, the question of the local patriotism, companionism, or something. I, I want to give you the, the, the yeah, to, to ask you the same question about Jerusalem, because uh, you did your, your managing the Iramim Association, and maybe you have something to say about the question of local. <laughs> Local patriotism versus uh, ethnicity, or not? I don't know. Thank you, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, respond to um, mm -hmm. uh, to Menachem. First of all, I will not contradict my uh, PhD too. <laughs> so no, uh, I, I, I just no, can't. So I will have <laughs> to uh, follow in his line. <laughs> no, but actually. Uh, um, it, uh, thank you also for the opportunity to speak for my professional uh, uh, well, um, the kind of to combine the two and, and, and they are combined. Uh, you should explain I what is the, Iramim, not, not everybody knows. What uh, is Iramim. Iramim is an uh, Israeli NGO, a human rights NGO that focuses on Jerusalem as a core issue uh, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, with the two goals to help promote a, an agreed upon solution to Jerusalem based on the vision of a, a city of two people. A city is both the present form and future capital of, of two people. And since the, the, this vision is, is somehow is quite removed from us today, we're also very much working on the ground on uh, human rights issues on the ground and and but also on on building i would say and and i very much like the notion of local patriotism on and it, it might it might be sound very ambitious but i, I think if you look at and and, and if you, i would like to connect what menachem said to what is happening on the ground in jerusalem today so on on the other hand on also uh, relating to abner to what you started with you know of the current days i mean jerusalem was burning just uh, just two, two uh, uh, weeks ago and and um, so and and but actually because of that, I would like to say that that even more strongly, um, even on the night of the of the huge right wing demonstration, which was quite horrible, and what was also uh, very frightening to see is the percentage of uh, of Haredi youth uh, in in this. Uh, so it's also the the shift of the right wing to new uh, uh, untraditional uh, uh, audiences uh, uh, of the right. And yet, 
there were so many Jerusalem concerned people, some of them hardcore activists, but many of them concerned people who just intermingled within the, the, the demonstrator, communicating with them, talking to them, but also I think what they wanted, what the, the main goal was to bear witness, to be there, to bear witness, and also to, uh, uh, to observe what, what is happening, how the police is, is responding. And they are representative of many, many active groups today in Jerusalem, in, in West Jerusalem that are active in so many different ways. Uh, 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 in Jerusalem today in reaching out, and I would not say coexistent, but I would say reaching out between West and East and understanding, they will never call it local patriotism, but they somehow, and somehow understand it deep down and, and that we are connected to this urban space together. And, and we have to somehow learn to share it and learn to share it in a more equal, more equal way. And also it, that it is not just about socioeconomic rights, which should be addressed to it, it's a severe issue in East Jerusalem, but it's also recognizing Palestinian as a community and Palestinian public, public life. And, 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 uh, and even though that it is so much at stake at the moment. It's so much threatened these very days. You know, what was it, what, what was it about closing the, uh, the, the Damascus Gate, you know, and, and, and at the time of Ramadan, if not an attack on Palestinian public life uh, in the city. But at the same time, it is challenged precisely from what Menachem uh, uh, said, from the ground, from civil society, from so many people that understand Jerusalem in a different way. And Jerusalem is the uh, biggest urban place in this region and with the biggest uh, urban societies, both Palestinians and, 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 and Israeli here in this place. So there's something very real about Jerusalem. And, and, and um, so many space and, 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 and so, so complicated, but yet something I can see how these local patriotism can be built, but also the many, many threats to it. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. What, yeah, question. So, sorry. That's the, Maybe the we, audience. Uh... Yeah, there are questions. I think we have, I don't see the who who asked the question. Um, I have a question. Yeah, but but Sheva. Yes. But Sheva, yes. Shalom. Good evening. Thank you so much for the fascinating uh, presentations. I I really enjoyed it. Um, I just wanted to know if if uh, you are aware of all the new initiatives um, between Jews and Arabs that are happening as we speak. Like uh, I, I'm coming from the world of poetry and literature, and there are wonderful projects with Palestine, um, translating uh, young Palestinians' uh, stories into Hebrew. Many people study Arabic not as the language of the enemy, like in the intelligence or the IDF, but they do with their neighbors. And there is an Israeli poetry anthology translated into Arabic in Arab schools, there is a um, there is an Arab Israeli um, movement on Dim uh, standing together. I mean, there are so many things that are happening now that that I think that belong to the new generation. The generation that is not so afraid of if there is awareness to that, there's a new voice in society. Thank you. Thank you for this question. But Sheva, I, I, I want to make, maybe because Sadia asked for uh, speaking and I'm sure that maybe she will have answers or uh, <laughs> something, but this, because we are coming back this question of translations, languages between Arabic and Hebrew and who learned which language in which 
uh, yes, in which uh, purpose, Sadia, please. Okay. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Batsheva. <laughs> Thank you very much for, um, for um, I mean, your comments. But I think you're right. There are initiatives, and there, there has always been initiatives, right? And maybe more today, but it does not mean like for the question of learning Arabic, that it's, well, everybody's learning Arabic. It's still a minority. There was a very interesting report by uh, a Vanir Institute um, led by a team of Yehuda Shinhar and some young researcher from uh, the Vanir Institute about the, um, the Arabic within the Jewish Israelis, you know, and it's, uh, but it's still, I mean, even like Jews from an Arab Jewish background, they don't speak Arabic. They're trying maybe, and, um, but initiative, I agree with you. The thing is that, um, I Maybe I will link it to two political um, question. Okay. To political um, more uh, question. Um, uh, Menachem, thank you very much for in your what you said. I would add just one thing. Um, also, a sovereign Palestinian state. This is this makes a big difference because I do believe that um, um, it's an injustice that need to be um, uh, to be, and the Palestinians would decide for themselves. Um, I agree with you with the question of ethnicity, but also a Palestinian sovereign state to, in order to give, um, to build um, a place that is for both, both, right? Jews and, and Palestinians, you know? The Jews are not going anywhere else and the Palestinians should not go anywhere else, even with the force, with the expulsion and so on. So anyway, just to Bathsheba to answer is, um, initiatives are here, are rare, you have translations, you have actually, there is a very rich history of translation done by Palestinians from Hebrew into Arabic. And this is from the 60s, right? Until today, Allah Lehal, he's a Palestinian writer, he's a translator also. And there's like, I was more, I worked more on these people to understand what they did, how they translated. They translated from Beirut, but also from, uh, uh, from El Jalil, from uh, Jerusalem, and also from Ramallah, right? A Madar Institute that translates a lot of, uh, especially historical and political documents. Um, just to finish, but um, this initiative will not um, uh, succeed if the political situation oh. remains as it is and it goes worse and worse. This is what I believe, right? And if, I agree um, with you. You know what I mean? It's, it's unfortunate, but you know, when starting visiting uh, Palestine, Israel, I met beautiful people who fight together, who go every Friday, and you know, against the destruction of uh, houses in uh, in Beit, in uh, Sheikh Jarrah and so on. But and it's not a pessimistic or optimistic. I don't think this is the issue. The issue there is the political situation. There is a sovereign state that. Uh, expand its land that oppresses the, the, the Palestinian within who are, who are supposed to be citizens. And if this is not resolved, I don't think it will go, um, you know, history will sh shows, you know, that this kind of situation that do not leave to a pe two people who live together. It's the opposite, you know, just separate more and more uh, people. Thank you, thank you, Sadia. I think yeah. All agree that, yeah, this uh, cul cultural history is definitely a, a political one. I just want to uh, maybe ask uh, Guy Elhanan, Guy Elhanan, I don't, I don't know, but for, for the very last question, we will try to uh, finish at 45. Guy, Guy, I don't know. Please. Thank you, thank you, merci, merci. Uh, it's uh, Guy Elhanan. Yeah. Um, thank you very, very much for all for all who spoke, uh, uh, fascinating, uh, um, fascinating uh, uh, lectures. Um, I would like to maybe uh, narrow my uh, comment to one question um, and maybe say uh, in that way something about what I do. Um, I was watching uh, Emmanuel Thiebaud's uh, lecture and I was thinking about the rarity of artistic collaboration, true artistic collaboration. Um, I would like to congratulate Emmanuel, especially for speaking about the present. Um, the Janine Freedom Theater is uh, 
an initiative of uh, Arna Merhamis and Giuliano Merhamis and Udi Aloni, and um, they are not uh, embarrassed or ashamed or hiding this uh, collaboration. Um, and I think this, the, the rarity of these kinds of collaborations is nearly archaeological. It's really, it's not that they don't exist, but it's like uh, um, one of the other lectures uh, here said uh, about hiding from the term Arabic, Arab, as the Mizrahi Jews are doing. So there's also um, <clears throat> this uh, hiding or, or underground history and present of uh, collaboration present. I'm talking about Jonathan Kunda, for example, or myself, people who actually go into theater work uh, bilingually. Um, and, but I'm also talk, talking about Arye Elias, one of the greatest uh, Iraqi actors um, uh, from Iraq, um, a Jewish uh, Iraqi, who uh, because of the um, Ashkenazi racism that wouldn't let him play uh, Hamlet with uh, an Arabic accent, um, he was obliged to make a living from directing and uh, teaching theater in uh, the what is called the Arab sector, the Palestinians uh, of uh, citizens of Israel. And this is like a very hidden history, just as much as the real story behind Giuliano's um, quest, I would say, uh, passing through a Masad street in Haifa. Uh, is, is nearly hidden. It's, it's really hard to find researchers who touch this uh, uh, point. And um, I, I have to say that I am motivated by optimism and I have a very clear interest in uh, such collaborations as a, a Jewish Israeli. Um, but um, I'm also, it gives uh, the opportunity to think about um, where are those uh, um, <clears throat> successes and failures of collaborations. And, uh, and it's very interesting to see how different domains reach them uh, or look for them. Um, notably the beach in Haifa or uh, the youth movements of the kibbutzim and all these attempts uh, throughout the years. And of course, uh, what was mentioned by uh, uh, Professor Ben Amos at the beginning, the, the memorial ceremony that I had the honor of participating in. Uh, this year. So um, I, I, will, I wanted to ask though, um, I'm sorry, I won't, I, won't, I won't speak much longer, but I want to ask a precise question to the Ir Amim. Um, um, you um, did. Yes, you did. Thank you. Um, about these, uh, the, the, the last riots, um, and thank you for, for talking about that, the riots in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, one of the most racist uh, displays that uh, we've ever seen of provocation and, and uh, racism and violence. Um, and I wanted to, to ask um, about uh, the Balfourians, I would call them, those uh, hundreds and thousands uh, of demonstrators a few blocks away in front of Netanyahu's uh, house, who are uh, not as leftist as the Sheikh Jarrah uh, activists, and to, to say the least, and, um, and this opportunity of, of uh, Palestinian and uh, settler uh, riots um, maybe was an opportunity for, for them to meet and maybe to join struggles, which is, I think, the greatest uh, challenge of this uh, place. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. I don't know if maybe yes, I, one word. Yes, uh, as, yes, okay. the riots the, as, as the, a place for the, meeting. The answer is some, uh, somewhere between optimism to what Sadia, Sadia yeah. uh, said about the minorism of these, uh, of these efforts. Uh, the Balfourism, sorry for all this ismin, uh, was generally a, a, you know, a kind of a mainstream a, a movement with a, only one goal to move, a, a, to have Netanyahu a, a move away from, from, from his office with, with actually hesitance to take any political, clear, you know, specific political agenda. But they were very, very interesting uh, uh, um, 
uh, at, uh, uh, collaborations or, or, or there were, there were a, a talk and communication between a, a leftist activist and the Balfour, the others, the activist from Balfour, and, and using this opportunity that all these Tel Avivians so-called uh, were coming to Jerusalem and on, on Saturday nights, and they were invited to come earlier and visit in Silwan and in Sheikh Jarrah, and, and actually few of them, and this is where, I mean, this is, now, now you have to choose. Are you optimistic? Because actually there were some, uh, uh, some uh, pot protesters from, from Balfour who are now joining regularly demonstration in Sheikh Jarrah and in, uh, in, in Silwan and are more and more interested in the, in the uh, Palestinian Israeli, Israeli issue and how it is manifested in Jerusalem. And there are not that few. But relatively, and Sadia is very right, if you judge by the, the, the size of the movement, they are minor. So this is uh, the question, but that's, this is the answer, but some very interesting uh, um, interaction actually created between by, by activists from the left, bringing them to what is actually happen, uh, uh, happening on the ground in Jerusalem. Thank you, Judith. And for sure, for sure, uh, we know, everybody knows that these political events were cultural events because, because of the people, the dress and so on. So back to the cultural history. And maybe, yeah, the, the optimism of action or of activism can be uh, uh, related to the pessimism of analysis. It's always the same. And I think we are in the middle of these uh, issues. Uh, Avner, maybe the, the, last, the, the final word, um, because we are very late. Well, it's uh, time to conclude. Uh, I think there's uh, one lesson that uh, we can probably take from this evening is that the relational approach does not belong only to the past, but also to the present and uh, very probably to the future, and uh, this is not about only about cultural history, but about society and politics as well. Uh, so I, I would like to thank you all, those who participated here in Jerusalem, those who participated um, wherever you are, all over the world, uh, to the audience, and um, good evening from Jerusalem. Goodbye to you all. Bye. Bye. And thank you very much. And I was really glad to see you in real. Thank you so much, everyone. Open, uh, Louis, for example, if you want to just. <laughs> let's try no, to have a, a third. We'll leave it for another time. I wish we had a, a chance to react to some of the comments, especially about Palestinian local nationalism in the Ottoman period that, yeah. that I think uh, uh, needed, uh, I wanted to say something, but I'll save it for another time. I, I don't think it was a mirror of Zionism in what, whatsoever, in, in, in no way, and I wanted to express that in some points, but we can save this for another time. That's, that's fine. Yeah, in real life. Thank you, Luis. Yes, yes. Great seeing everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Sarah, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.